Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophia. Once again, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Gallardo. He is the, direct, the program director for our MA in clinical psychology, Aliento program, which services Latinx communities. Um, welcome, Dr. Gallardo. Thank you for coming. Could you tell us a little bit about the program itself and let us know um, what prospective students can expect from the program and what current students may expect, something new that's coming up? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for organizing, Dr. Dorn, and, and really, really grateful to our um, four alumni who are here. Um, so everything that I'm going to talk about today is really, I think, a testament to um, those students who are here, those alumni who are here with us today, and also the students who are currently in our program. And, uh, you know, future students who come um, to the program. And so our you know, our program is really a, um, uh, I think, I think when I, I'm going to start with the new developments just to kind of context the, the program, but uh, I think over the years, we have really become much more of a, um, I think, collaborative endeavor in many ways. I, I always tell folks that we're, we're trying to run a decolonial program in a colonial system, and uh, that's not always an easy thing to do sometimes. And so we're really trying to almost flip the script in some ways when we think about how we do education um, with our students and 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 in the program in general. And so I think one of the things that we're really trying to do at this point is really is really re sort of deconstruct and decolonize, um, you know, even historically our program where we started, you know, 10, 11 years ago and where we are now and then just thinking about how we can continue to do that just within the larger education system. And so our program is really moving towards, in many ways, much more intentional and meaningful, uh, I think, partnerships with our students in co-creating our curricula, uh, classes, what we do, uh, and really giving them uh, truly a voice in the process. And I think that's partly what I think our program really stands for in many ways is is really making sure that the students who come to the program are seen, they're heard, they're validated um, for everything that they are, the, the wholeness of who they are uh, in many ways, um, for all the strengths and the resources and the resiliency they bring, uh, and also the lived experiences. You know, I think um, we really want to validate and affirm that um, everything that they're bringing with them is um, is important and 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 meaningful in our work and in the work that they're going to do in the future. So our program has really evolved in I think a lot of meaningful ways because of our students who've been in our program and given us feedback and um, and continue to help us change and grow. Um, our program is really designed for students who, you know, I would say have an interest in working for, with a cultural. Uh, social justice framework, if you will. We, we certainly are, I think, spending some extra time um, deliberately and intentionally talking about Latinx communities um, in, in, in real meaningful ways, I hope. Um, but I always tell students that any anyone who comes in our program, I think that they're just going to see, hopefully see the work differently and, and really kind of look at, at what they do just through a cultural social justice liberation lens with whomever they choose to work with in the future. Um, most of our students are continuing to work with Latinx communities in some meaningful way, in some important way, but also they're working with a lot of different communities. So while our program is Latinx specific, I think it does a good job of preparing students to work just in really culturally grounded ways, um, you know, moving forward. I always tell folks, we're really kind of starting from a cultural lens and I think our other programs start more from that traditional clinical lens. And so, and then they just kind of sprinkle in culture here and there where necessary and where needed. And we, we try to really go like, well, let's start with a cultural lens. And then everything that you get gets filtered that comes to you, hopefully you're filtering it through those particular viewpoints and perspectives in many ways. And so our curriculum is about 50-50, which means that about almost half of the curriculum is Latinx specific course content. And the other half of the curriculum is, um, is from our general evening format MFT program. And so students are getting a little bit of both in, in many ways, the sort of the more traditional kind of educational experiences and also maybe a more culture specific one 
with the Aliento program. We've designed it to be a cohort model um, because we know that in community, um, we thrive, in relation, we thrive, um, uh, in connection, we thrive in many ways. And so many of our students are first-generation students. And so um, I've, I've, I've continued to fight for you know, resources and making sure that whoever we bring to the program, that we have the resources available to support those students when they're here. If not, then we're just perpetuating more of the same as an academic institution in many ways. And so um, I think the university has always responded well to those requests. And, and, uh, and so we continue to increase our resources that we have available for our students. Um, we have a full-time academic advisor program administrator now um, that's just dedicated for our program and for our students, which I th think has been a great resource um, for our students. Uh, several of our students have started an Aliento community organization, which has been a great resource for our students. Um, and uh, really, they're very active in creating workshops and trainings and, and really just making sure that students' voices are represented uh, in our program and throughout the university. We try to always um, support students by providing them with a mentor in the program, whether it's an uh, upper division student or an alumni uh, to try to support them. And we're continuing to kind of modify and adapt our programs and what we do based on student feedback. Um, I've always said that, you know, we're not perfect. We we sort of learn as we go. We stumble and fall. We, But we got to learn from the things that we do that aren't working so well and try to make them better. Um, and I think that's one of our greatest assets and resources is that we are open to changing and continuing to evolve and we don't want to remain stagnant in, in many ways as a program. And I think that's important. So for students who come, I think something that's important for students who come, I think historically, you know, a lot of students have wanted to come to our program because of what we offer. And then I think sometimes students get a little bit challenged with sort of how we're doing things, even in the curricula, because it's really, it's sometimes it's really different. It really diverges from the traditional. And so I, I always tell students, you know, if you're when you come, like just be ready to unlearn unlearn some of the things maybe that you've already learned in some ways and 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 really kind of think about that this is going to be a little bit of a different experience um in in some ways for you um you know again we are in a traditional system so there, there's going to be some things that feel similar but there's going to be some things that are different and so i'd say you know really really come um with um you know really wanting to and being open to unlearning what you know and what you think you know um and and i think a sense of humility is really important too in, in many ways um and then also that really you know we're, we're really um, wanting to make sure that we validate the lived experiences of our students and and really help them um you know radical healing starts with radical self-love and so we hope that our students you know continue in that process as individuals in relation to each other so that then when they go out and, and serve communities um, you know they're in a they're in a good space to be able to do that in the best way that they possibly can. So I don't know I don't know Dr. Dorn if I answered if I sort of tapped into all the areas or not. But if I miss anything, please let me know. No, you absolutely did. That's a great overview of what to expect going into the program. Great. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, at this point, I want to bring in Frania Demergian. She's with our GSEP Career Services. So um, I want Frania to talk a little bit about what career services have to, has to offer. Um, Dr. Gallardo mentioned the resources that are available to students. So Frania, could you please tell us a little bit about what career services um, has to offer for students and once the students graduate and become alumni? Sure, yes, thank you, Dr. Darn. Hi everyone, my name is Frania Demergian and I'm the career services specialist at GSEP Career Services. And Pepperdine is distinct in that each graduate school has its own career services department. So as a result, you're able, we're able to provide you with the boutique style customized service delivery for our graduate students. So you're not only engaging in a academic experience, but a career development experience as well. And here at Career Services, I'd also like to mention Handshake. Handshake is our career management portal where you can access employment listings, including student employment, professional events, resources, and appointments. And it's for our students and our alumni also have access to Handshake. 
Um, our appointments, we offer two types, which are the career design sessions and the document feedback sessions. So the career design sessions, they're designed to clarify your purpose, create a strategy, and develop an action plan. Whereas our document feedback sessions, they're more straightforward um, to receive feedback on your resume, your cover letter, or even your LinkedIn profile. And so um, we always tell our students and our alums to please connect with us early and often. Even after you graduate as an alum, you can come back and connect with us, use our services free of charge. So we're here for life. Thank you. Thank you, Frania. Thank you so much for all of that wonderful information about career services. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our four alums who are going to talk about their experiences within this program. And um, just to let the students who are joining us know, um, if you have any questions for either Dr. Gallardo or Frania or the alums, um, you can ask questions in the chat and you can also put them in the Q&A. Um, we wanna make sure that we answer any questions that you may have. Um, also, at the end, um, we'll be able to open uh, the question and answers up. So if you want to um, just voice your opinion or uh, vocalize your questions, uh, you'll be able to do that too. Okay, so at this time, uh, welcome to our four alums who are joining us today. We have um, Fatima Zelada Arenas, Grecia Vasquez, Monica Bernal Medrano and Sofia Alonzo Baez. So welcome to the four of you. Thank you for joining us. At this time, I want to ask the first thing, tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and how did you decide on selecting the um, Aliento program to be a part of? And then also tell us what you are currently doing um, in your careers. So um, the first person I'll start with is Monica. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm from the Coachella Valley. I, was, I wasn't born here, but I was basically raised here my whole life. Um, and if you know anything about the Coachella Valley, other than Coachella Festival, um, we're very small, very intimate, 80% Latinx community filled with really rich ethnicities. And it's like, I love it. It's like so amazing. Other than the desert heat, it's the most best place to be here. Um, I decided to look for a school that really catered to my people. Um, and it was really hard because not a lot of schools offer that, which really sucks because after going and graduating from Pepperdine, you really notice the difference um, in perspective of what you learned, what you unlearned, and just how different like other clinicians come from other schools. Not to say that one is better than the other, it's just very different. And I think I much more preferred and I'm glad that this was my, my destined route. Um, but I chose Pepperdine because they offered the Aliento program. And as someone who is part of the Latinx community and uh, maybe a lot of people can relate where I feel like I look a little too white to be Me Mexican and a little too Mexican to be white. I really wanted to learn what it felt like for others and what it felt like for myself to unlearn these things and these thoughts and these patterns and how to be, you know, a great impact to my community from the inside out, just like how that the program is trying to do actively all the time. So yeah, that's where, that's where I'm at. And now I'm working at the Riverside Latino Commission community. So I work with uh, K through 12 uh, children and families of the Coachella Valley. And we are the only um, organization in the Coachella Valley that currently serves mental health services for free for everybody in the Coachella Valley. So, oh, wow. that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, next, Sophia, tell us a little bit about your background, why you selected this program, and what you're doing now. Thank you, everyone. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm from Mexico, Mexico City, born and raised in Mexico. I came here to the United States when I was 27. So basically, I start from scratch, learning everything or learning so many things. And um, so I did my bachelor's um, in Mexico. Um, being here was like nothing. So um, I then as um, as soon as I get done all my English LSA um, 
courses, um, that sent me to find a um, master's. So I was looking for a master's to fit with my values, my, you know, my um, style, you know, my passion, my uh, community. And uh, one of my friends mentioned to me, do you know Pepperdine? You know, what is Pepperdine? I didn't know even, you know, so many things. And she said, you know, I went to Pepperdine. Probably you can find something in there. You yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I took a look and right away found this, like, this is it. This is the one that I want. I, I was not looking for more. This is the one because just what I was looking for, it was there. So I didn't think twice. I go straight to apply. And of course, you know, we're going to talk about the challenges, but um, yeah, that was um, easy for me in that way to find it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So um, currently I'm working uh, in my private practice and um, also I'm a professor at Pepperdine University under Latin community, Latin community. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Gracia, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, oh, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Gracia. Um, let's see. Uh, so I chose Pepperdine, um, kind of, sort of, a little bit at random. Um, it was either that or go to New York um, for like this other Spanish program that I didn't really look much into, um, but I just know that I wanted to be in New York. Um, luckily, that it didn't work out. Um, but yeah, so I, I studied. I did my bachelor's at UC Santa Cruz. I took a year off. I did a AmeriCorps program. Um, and I think it was then that I really wanted to like be a part of the community and continue to help, um, right? Just like be of service. Um, and then like, they kind of offered that. I think I remember um, my interview with Gagardo. He was like, you know, you're doing what this program is meant to be, to be, right? Um, and I was like, sold. Thanks. I said me. Cool. I'm there. Um, yeah, so it, it was, it was, I was there. Um, Aliento was uh, definitely kind of like Monica said, right? It offers a lot of like the support and nuances um, necessary to be able to support, you know, our communities because there are so many nuances and there are so many things that other clinicians just don't take into account, which are necessary um, and unfortunate, right? Sometimes it's um, we do a disservice, um, whether we want to or not, or like on purpose or not. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's kind of you know where my values lined up with with Aliento. Um, and it did help, you know, that we have a cohort, all of the professors were amazing um, and supportive. Um, and in this moment, I am currently on a therapy hiatus on purpose. Um, rest is necessary. We listen to a lot of heavy things. Um, so yeah, I'm just here. But besides that, I've worked in a lot of um, community centers, um, agencies, schools, um, juvenile facilities, um, outpatient, you know, a whole slew of things, which is both a blessing and a curse, I think, right? Because you have so many opportunities and so many options, and sometimes it's hard to pick. Um, but it's great that it, we have this, you know, possibility. Um, yeah, I think I touched on everything. Yes, yes, thank you, and thank you for joining us. And Fatima, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here, um, share a little bit about my story. So um, when I was, I always knew that I wanted to go to graduate school and I had actually been looking around for many years um, and I didn't find just like, you know, some of my fellow alums shared, this is really a, a one of a kind program. So as soon as I found it, I knew that this is what I wanted, where I wanted to go. And um, I think just because it aligned really well with um, my values, like Sophia shared and really me wanting to give back to, to my community um, and especially just kind of given some of my lived experiences and things that me and my family had been through. So there was really no other choice for me <laughs> other than this program. Um, and, and I really feel like it was um, it exceeded all of my expectations, which was wonderful. Um, just kind of the coursework, be, being able to have that cohort model. Um, Gracia and I were in the same cohort. It's so nice to see you. Um, and so, I mean, it's it's a wonderful experience um, through the whole process. And I really love what Dr. Erdo said at the very beginning about how, um, you know, a lot of, of the goal is for us to work through the things that we need to work through while we're taking our courses, because once we um, start working with clients, all of that kind of comes 
comes into play. And so it's really critical to, to do that. And I feel like we really were, at least I felt very well prepared for that. And I felt like, um, you know, I had a really good understanding of where I stood emotionally so that I could be able to help support other people. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. I um, currently, I um, am I'm at a nonprofit organization. Most of my career I have spent working um, in oncology, so working with patients who have cancer um, and families. And so right now I oversee our kind of clinical programming uh, within that nonprofit and just, you know, love that work of being able to be of service to patients and families who are facing um, cancer. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you had mentioned about, and Dr. Gallardo mentioned this too, about this being a cohort model. So being in a cohort, did you find that helpful? Did you find it challenging? Or what did you think of that? How did that work for you? Um, Fatima, since you had just mentioned that, I'm going to ask you what you thought of being in a cohort model. Sure. So I, I thought it was a really wonderful experience. Um, I'm very close with a couple of the people that were part of my cohort. We're still very much in touch. Um, I think the the beauty of it is just that you kind of have a group of people that you go through the program with. Um, and some of us were on a shorter path. Some of us were on a longer path um, of the program. And so I was lucky that I had a couple of people that were with me. I did the four year path. So were with me the whole four years. And so I um, it was it was wonderful because you were able to really um, grow. You're able to kind of develop friendships and relationships. And when we're in practicum together as well, um, it's so helpful to be able to talk to someone else who's going through the same thing that you're going through, who's you know having their first experience working with clients, you know. And so you're able to kind of bounce ideas off of each other. We also uh, were in school during the pandemic, so you know, in the middle of <laughs> of the program, um, we had to go remote. And so it was really great to be able to have people that you could still kind of maintain um, relationships with um, be when we went remote and when we didn't weren't able to see each other all the time. Um, so I, for me, it was a wonderful experience and I still very much value um, a lot of the relationships that came out of that model. Um, but just being able to go to classes together, you know, interact with each other and see each other, you know, within classes and then even outside of classes, I think is invaluable um, in, in, in this type of work. That's good to know. Gracia, you, you were in the same cohort. So did you feel that you had the same type of experience or was your experience a little bit different? I think similar. I was going to say retweet, but I don't know where we are with the Twitterverse at the moment. Um, yeah, I think definitely highlighting, you know, bouncing off ideas because we were on different paths, but still in the same cohort, we were able to, you know, how did this class go for you? What is this assignment? Like, how did you kind of navigate that? Um, so it was really helpful in that regard and, you know, still close to some of the cohort to this day. And even just like hearing the differences like within our cohort and other cohorts, right? Um, kind of still bouncing off ideas and navigating those relationships. Um, and I was also a person who went to Argentina with the cohort. So even um, even more immersed program um, and that's offered. And that was super amazing and surreal. And, you know, you grew even closer together. So nice. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, Sophia, what about you being in the cohort model? Did, was that challenging for you? Was it helpful to you? I was the second cohort, so <laughs> very much the, the, the initiation probably. Yeah, my cohort um, was very interesting for me. Um, many smart women, strong women in my cohort, so I learned so many. Uh, one of my best friends is from that cohort, and uh, I'm still uh, doing communication with many of them, so very proud of the way that they taught me in that class, in that cohort, so many things. So um, even if I don't have the connections anymore with many of them, so I learned a lot of things. But yeah, definitely very, very proud of each one. Oh, that's good. That's good. Monica, what about you being in a cohort? Was that helpful to you? Did you learn a lot from that? How, how did you like being in the cohort? Yeah, um, I, I joined my cohort at like the heat of the pandemic. So I spent my first year in grad school all on Zoom. Um, and so when we got back, it was a little awkward, um, but I think it's kind of like 
everything was awkward when we got back to school. Like nobody wanted to sit really close to each other. No one really wanted to talk. So it was really challenging in that sense. But I mean, that was in everybody's fault. Um, um, one thing I will say is that I graduated. Um, I graduated in two years and most of my cohort did the three year program. So I will say that if like your timeline aligns with it, I would I would have definitely done the three years just because it does grow you really, really close to one another. Um, I just had another goal <laughs> to get to. And so I was in a rush. But um, yeah, it was still really nice to have a really supportive environment. And I think having gone through such a traumatic experience coming back, our teachers were like, extra fond of us and like nurturing of us and making sure that everything felt really safe for us to be there with one another. So that was really nice. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. You know, at this time, um, it's, I see that we have some questions that are coming in. So Sophia, um, could you uh, talk to us about some of the questions that um, the students have? Yes, of course. So one of the uh, questions that we got from a student is, how's it, how does the program promote self-care and well-being among students, as well as a sense of community? And we can start with Dr. Gallardo, and then we can hand it over to our alumni panelists to add a little more information. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Um, you know, I, I think we certainly, um, the, the cohort model that we 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 implemented at the outset, I think is really one of our primary aims is tr trying to create community as much as possible. Um, you know, so what that what that cohort model really looks like is that, you know, you, like, like, like some of the alumni have mentioned, they're on different year paths or, or sort of, you know, timelines, if you will, but, or I should say, and, and the cohort model, really, we just ask, the only thing we ask of our students every entering class is that they take all of their Aliento courses together. Um, so that's sort of at the, the foundation of it. So all their Aliento courses are taken together. And then any, any other, other courses they take in the general MFT form, format, evening format program, you know, they can they can do that as as they choose to and, and at whatever pace they want to. We find, though, that oftentimes that even those courses, they're trying to coordinate their schedules and take those classes together so that they're not the only Aliento student in a general evening format class. Um, which sometimes can really, you know, almost be like a culture shock to a certain degree for some of our students coming from our classes and then going to the general evening format classes. There's a little bit of a transitionary time process that happens there in some ways uh, for our students. So we we certainly try to do that with the cohort model. I think our we have an Aliento community organization that uh, is really also uh, geared towards helping our students develop a sense of community. And, and also really uh, a lot of have a lot of say in what happens in our program oftentimes. We also started um, uh, implementing one social each semester. One of our previous students, as I was talking to her on her way out of the program, I said, give me some feedback. I said, you know, get, tell me what, what you think we should do. And she said, I, I really think you need to have socials, but not outside of class time. Because that's an that's an even larger commitments for some of us to try to go outside of class time. So do it during class times, when um, and so we did that. So that that following semester, I started implementing social one social each semester in the fall and the spring on our Aliento class days, so that our students can come together, build community, just hang out. We provide the food. Um, we even did it this last time where they could invite family members and loved ones that they wanted to bring with them. And so some of them brought their significant others. Uh, we didn't get any parents or tias and tios this time, but I'm hoping in the future we'll get some extended family. Um, but, you know, those are, those are, our, it's like, it's like, you know, who's part of the community, you know, who's part of the students community and how can they become part of our community? Because if they're a part of our community, then there's more continuity of care and compassion and success ultimately for the students at the end of the day. We have a statement in our syllabi too that's a family community statement, which we just implemented a couple of semesters ago. We said, look, we know that there are external demands that are being placed on you and you shouldn't have to make a decision whether you come to class or not just because of those external things that happen. So if you need to bring your child with you one day to class, if you need to bring your 
the, the family member that you're taking care of one day to class or a few classes, because it's either you, you come to class or you stay home or you miss class, you know, it's okay to bring those family members. It's okay to bring the community with you if you need to in many ways. Um, we certainly also offer Zoom options for those cases as well for students. So I think we're really trying, community is important. Connection is important for us. And I think we're continuing to try to find ways to, to be intentional and meaningful about how we do that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Gallardo. Um, for any of our panelists, um, feel free to jump in if you want to share anything else regarding how Aliento forms a sense of community and maybe some things that you did um, where the help program helped you promote um, self-care. Um, and I'll go to Grecia to start that off for us. Yeah, we had a couple of those. Um, it just left my brain, just like those events. Um, and they were, it was like on a random Saturday, I think, or something. Um, but it was fun. We literally just played with idea. We had food and then everybody went their merry way. Um, but yeah, I think it was a lot of it was just like because of the cohort, right? A lot of us just like stuck together. We'd go to the El Torito, like down the street and just like go for a Taco Tuesday, right? Um, I think it was something that we kind of um, decided as a collective that it was just like important for us to take a step away from what we needed to do. Um, it would get done, but just like, the community sense, right? Um, yeah, so there, there's that for sure. Um, and I think I'm remembering, you know, a lot of the professors are like, well, this is heavy stuff that you're listening, especially when you start practicum, right? This is heavy stuff that you're listening to. What are you doing to offset that? And how is the practicum site helping you? And how are, you know, how is your village helping you kind of navigate all those things? Um, so it's, it's there for sure. Um, and it comes in a little bit of waves too, especially I think, um, when you are in the Aliento specific courses, that's when it's definitely kind of apparent. Um, I think it I got to put it well where it's like a little bit of a culture shock when you're stepping into the regular MFT courses. Thank you so much, Grecia. Um, we also have another question from a student that asks, how was the work-life balance before beginning um, practicum? And <laughs> start this question off with Sophia. Uh, how was it? I'm sorry, I, I missed out the, the second part of the question. Mm -hmm. um, the student asked, how was the work-life balance before beginning um, practicum? Well, <laughs> um, you know, it, it was challenging because it was. I'm not going to lie you, like, you know, it was so easy because you have to balance, you know, your life, your self-care and the practicum. Um, I apply for two practicum um, places. One required to me a lot of, um, um, like the same time, 10 hours per, um, per week, but it was more about paperwork. So, um, but both they were very, um, uh, it, it was a huge motivation for me to be there. So I arrange my life, my, my, my needs, my expectations to be able to work with the practicum. So, um, yeah, at the beginning, you know, when you start doing that, it's just adjustment that you have to do. But once you get to that point when you say, okay, I can't do it, or I need to remove something. So it is really good. The great thing that you do at Pepperdine is like you have the practicum class, then you can talk with your professor. And, you know, they can tell you and guide you, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. I mean, not like you have to, they suggest your little things in how to improve things. That was very helpful for me to have that in that moment. And I even continue, you know, remember some of those tips that I had previously now that I had my private practice. But yeah, it was it was really nice, but, you know, challenging at the same time. Thank you so much, Sophia. Fatima, do you have any uh, maybe tips that you would share with our students regarding how to have that work or that balance? Absolutely. So um, I agree with what Sophia shared, which is that it's challenging, especially when you're in practicum and you're balancing school and seeing clients. And I was also at the time working full time and I'm a mom. So 
you kind of have to, you know, pull on your community and your support system, whatever that support system looks like for you. Um, and, and I was lucky to, to have a, a wonderful group of people around me that helped me during that time. Um, so I think that's critical. Um, and then just finding time, right. And, and making sure that uh, for me at that time, I, it, everything was very scheduled and I, I'm not of particularly um, organized person in, in life, but during that time, I knew it was like required of me because otherwise, you know, things were going to fall through the cracks. So just know when, when the time comes that it, it's important to schedule and to have things planned out um, because it's going to be really important. Um, the other thing I want to share is just that um, I think when you're seeing, when you're working with clients, um, self-care and doing something for yourself is a must. It's not something that you can really compromise. So you have to prioritize it. And we started practicum or I started practicum right when we went remote and we're, so everything was virtual. And so I had to make it a point every single day um, to do something, to go for a walk, whatever it was, you know, whatever it looked like for me, um, it was like a requirement. And I did that intentionally. And it was just based on a lot of the kind of conversations and the, you know, the coursework and the things that it had come up while I was taking my courses, um, because, and that really, you know, kind of emphasize the importance of self-care, but in particular, when you're working with clients, because you're taking on heavy things, you have to have an outlet for that. So I would just say, you know, and I say this to everyone, if you are working with clients, you know, that's not something you can compromise on. Self-care is critical, um, when you're working with, with people actively. So I don't know if that helps, but. No, that definitely helped. Thank you so much. And I, um, I'm i glad that you made that point about self-care being a requirement because here at Pepperdine, we also have free wellness um, program resources for you that we put in the chat. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that, Fatima. Um, and in regards to practicum, another student asked, how long does it typically take to finish practicum? And also, if you have any books or maybe resources, videos that you recommend reading before starting the program. Um, and I can start off that question or those questions with Monica. So first, how long does it typically take to finish practicum? Um, I want to say that it's different for everyone just because of depends on how many hours you want to get. I know there's like the LPCC and then the MFT. I did the MFT and it took me two semesters. Um, and this was coming towards the end of the pandemic. So it's still kind of rough trying to get client hours because a lot of people didn't want to meet face to face. Um, but it's doable. It's manageable if you just, you try your best and you take care of yourself. Um, I had, I would say it's a privilege because not a lot of schools offer this. I had a mentor who really, really helped me and guided me and was a really great support system in trying to manage my hours and understand the deadlines I had on top of the deadlines that I'm going to have after I graduate. So it was really helpful to have her. So if you have the opportunity to join that, I definitely think you guys should really like jump on it and then come back as mentors yourself if you can. Thank you, Monica. Um, the other question was in regards to any books um, that you recommend before starting the program. Um, and I'm also curious, um, Sophia, if you can share more about how um, the process worked in terms of international application and being an international student. Yeah, I can start that with you, Sophia. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I believe it was kind of the same, um, right, Dr. Gallardo, but uh, just uh, the LS, uh, the TOEFL um, for English. So you, you have to have that um, and the interview with Dr. Gallardo. So, um, you know, I didn't see like a, so many barriers to get to the program. I mean, to apply as an international student. Um, if I, you know, it is so much help. And this is one of the things that I'm going to suggest you to ask because it's so many resources at the university. You know, Dr. Gallardo is one of those that it's very open to 
even to help you to, you know, to, to, with, you know, things that probably for you are like a very small, but, you know, probably that little small doesn't allow you to apply. So just ask for that. And I think Dr. Gayer is going to be one of those. It's one of the things that I remember. I'm sorry, I'm going to, it was like a, some years ago, um, but for the international students, it was that. And also I have to, um, uh, all my transcript, all my basically uh, uh, previous program from Mexico, the the bachelors, the everything was uh, transcript and um, and yeah, that's it. And in fact, I have I was able to waive two classes uh, at the master program because my bachelors in Mexico, uh, you know, covered that. So. That was really nice also. Yeah, I don't know, Sophia, if I was able to answer that oh, question. That was great. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, we also have more questions coming in um, and a comment about, I love how the program feels like a second supportive family. And thank you so much to our panelists for the tips. My question is more on how are you able to afford the program? And is there any help for DACA students. Um, and Dr. Gallardo, I can start off that question with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the um, we certainly offer, um, there's certainly financial aid that's available to students. We certainly, we try to, I mean, the thing that that always keeps me up at night is, is you know, sort of finding the rhythm between our, our tuition cost and and also making sure that we're that the students who come to the program and graduate um, are able to seek out the opportunities that are important to them and have those available to them and you know I think there's so far we're we're, we're doing well in those areas I think for many of our students and so I, I feel okay about that I, I don't feel great about it because I feel like you know the the one thing that we're always trying to do is figure out how to offset the cost of our tuition for our students so we have some scholarships we have some grants and obviously financial aid um what we what we started doing some years ago was you know really doing our own research around opportunity scholarship opportunities for our own students and so we we continue to update those lists every semester send those to the students um you know so that they see that there's opportunities available for them to apply for additional scholarships or additional opportunities um we know that that includes students um who um, who may be undocumented and um, and we find scholarships that are available for our students in those situations and scenarios as well um, and and really try to be supportive across the board as much as possible. Uh, I'd like to say that our tuition is going down or decreasing, but it's not. Um, and and so so we in fact we in fact I, as as those things continue to evolve, I'm a very vocal advocate for. You know how do we increase our fundraising and donors efforts um, to offset our our cost of tuition for students and um, and so we're we're always in the process of trying to do that as much as possible um, and uh, and trying to find ways to make sure we offset the, the tuition. The other thing we do, and then I'll turn it over to the alumni. Um, we have graduate assistantships. We have uh, teaching assistantships. We have research assistantships uh, available for our students as well, which are all paid positions. Uh, and we we really you know encourage students when they're able to, and it seems like reasonable based on their life schedules and everything else they have going on, to try to take advantage of some of those opportunities as well, um, because those are other ways that they can um, you know offset cost and 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 earn a little bit of of financial resources while they're in the program as well. So. Thank you, Dr. Gallardo. That was um, really great information. Um, I, we have another question. Um, um, from a student that says, I have submitted all documents for the application. How should I prepare myself for the interview? Um, if any of our alumni panelists can share maybe a little bit about that. Um, I will start it off with Monica. Um, it's a great question. Um, I'll toot my own horn here and say that I've been told I'm a great interviewer and I never prepare myself beforehand because I feel like it takes away from who I am. Um, and I try to just be really authentic and be human first in that space with whoever I'm with. 
Um, I know when I was in my interview with Dr. Gallardo, it was a very surreal moment because as a first generation Latina and, you know, it was very intimidating um, to be doing this for the first time as a lot of students, like he said, are doing this for the first time. And I would just say, it sounds so cheesy, but just be yourself because he'll be able to understand it. Whoever's interviewing is going to be able to pick up on the type of person that you are and see like how great you are. You're here for a reason. And I always repeat that because that's what Dr. Gallardo used to always tell everybody. It's like, you're here for a reason. You're not, you're good enough to be here. You're more than good enough to be here. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, and I know that imposter syndrome really, really, really kicks in. Um, but I really feel like if you're just really honest about your intentions and what you want to do, I think you have a really good chance of being in this program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Grecia, do you have anything that you would like to share for students? Um, I am a terrible interviewer, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I cannot toot my own horn. Um, <laughs> But I think I, I'd like to highlight just like showing up as yourself and being honest, right? Um, you know, what Monica said about like what your intentions are will kind of shine through that, um, whether you're good at answering questions or not. And I think if anything, this is a program to be able to do that, right? Um, because it is, um, I think I said this earlier, right? Of like, this is a decolonial program in a colonial system. And if not here, then where, right? Um, so why not put yourself out there? just learn all you can about Oliento and then do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Gallardo. I'll um, finish it off with you if you have any little tips for, for our students that are getting prepared for the interview. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think I think what what um, Gracia and Monica said are, are I think are, you know, just 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 be who you are. I, I, I saw someone said be human first. And I think that that's important. I always tell students that I I, I really am, am much more interested in, in who you are as a human being in person than anything that you've submitted in the application or any numbers. Numbers can't tell me a whole lot. And, you know, um, I, I like reading the personal statements just to learn about the students' experiences. And um, and and I think I think just learning, I always tell students, you know, this is not in, in, intended to be a stressful endeavor. It's an opportunity just to get to know each other, for you to ask questions of our program as well, and for me to learn a little bit about who you are. And um, you know, I think I think that's the most important thing. I um, I just you know I want to know who people are really, and 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 you know, as as people, as human beings, and the other things will come later in some way, in, in many ways, the the book stuff, the content stuff, the the class stuff, and. Um, you know, that stuff people can learn. Um, but I just kind of want to know, know who we, who, who human to human, who, who are we in this process together and, um, and, and who you are. And that's, that's the most important thing for me at the end of the day. Cause if the, I would tell our students like, look, you know, when, when you finish, you know, most of the people you're going to work with are not going to ask you where you went to school maybe, or what grades you got in this class or, you know, what, what, what you did, they're just going to want to know who you are and, and, and who you are in the context of trying to provide a service to them and walk with them and support them. And, and, and there are some things that we just can't, no program can really teach um, to students and, and some of those things. And so, um, so, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm always much more interested in the human being before me than anything else. So. Thank you, Dr. Gallardo. Um, we have one last question. Um, a student asked, I was wondering if there's an orientation for the program, and if so, when, or at least what I should expect during the summer before I officially start the program. There is, there is an orientation. It's usually the 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 last week of August, I think, is when that is. Um, yeah, it's, it's and so there's there's a whole orientation there. I would say any student though who has, I'm just looking at the date to see if we have it there uh, already set. Um, yeah, I don't know what day it's going to be, but it's the last, usually the last week of August sometime, um, and it'll be at the Irvine campus. But I would say that any student, and so we'll go over a lot of stuff too during that orientation and introduce you to all the services that are available on, on campus. Um, but I would say that any student who's already, um, you know, matriculated and made a commitment to come to the program, you know, feel free to reach out to me, to Lily, uh, Liliana Vasquez, 
um, you know, about any questions you have or anything that could be helpful for you. And we'll, we'll get you any, any, um, any, any resources or information that you need in preparation as well. So. Thank you, Dr. Gallardo. Um, and we also have just one more question, actually, because I know we kind of um, interchange Aliento and Latinx Communities Program. So um, can you just help clarify that for our students? Yes, yes. So 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 the Aliento is the the, the sort of the, the 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 sort of the name of the the hub, if you will, the center, if you will, that houses our Latinx training program and also um, research that faculty do and community outreach that we do. So it's, so Aliento, the Center for Latinx Communities is, is a sort of our overarching container, if you will. And then within that, we have our, 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 our program that we're talking about today, which is a, our MFT program with an emphasis in Latinx communities. We have research um, that we faculty do in the community, and we have community outreach and education that both our students do and faculty do, and relationships we have with um, with entities in the community. I always think it's important that we we bridge the town and the gown together, if you will, uh, as much as possible. And um, you know, I think that's a big part of why we're here is to make sure that we're relevant and. And in meaningful, in a meaningful way, to to serve community members and to be available and accessible to community and to provide support to community, both our students and also faculty and 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 some of the work that we do. So that's that's the main distinction between the two. I think in, most people just refer to it as the Aliento program. Uh, it's just sort of over time evolved into that, which is fine. Um, but we also made an intentional effort to change our name. It was Latina Latino before, and we changed it to Latinx um, because uh, it's important that we we create a, a um, and we have a front facing, and not just a front facing, but also a really intentional commitment to inclusiveness and to belonging in our program. You know, Latinx communities are incredibly diverse, and we welcome all uh, the diversity within our communities. Um, you know, um, from from um, you know sexual orientation, gender identification, um, you know, Afro Latino, wh whoever it may be, class, racial, ethnic diversity, internet, country diversity, place of birth diversity, whatever it may be, um, you know, that's important for us, and um, we really uh, want to make sure that we're um, we're affirming the 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 humanity and the diversity within our communities as much and, and beyond and beyond. So we changed our name to Latinx to honor that. Thank you, Dr. Gallardo. And thank you to all of our panelists. This Aliento program is so in, um, intentional and I really thank you for sharing that sense of community. Um, and at this time, I'll hand it over to Dr. Dorn to finish off the presentation, but just thank you so much to everyone for being here with us today. Thank you, Sophia. And once again, just like Sophia said, thank you. Thank you for joining us today for our Student Alumni Roundtable. Um, hopefully you received a lot of helpful information. Um, so for those of you who are trying to make a decision about this program, hopefully this has helped you to make the decision to go ahead and apply to the program to be a part of our Pepperdine community. Um, Sophia, if you could put on the screen uh, the contact information. So for those of you who, if you have any questions um, regarding this program or any of our Pepperdine programs, you could always contact our office at gscpalum at pepperdine.edu. And you can also call us at 310-568-5649. Our Alumni Relations Office is located at the West LA campus, which is the 6100 Center Drive in Los Angeles. And we also have a LinkedIn group that um, people are always welcome to join um, so they can find out different information. Um, thank you, Dr. Gallardo, for being here. Thank you, Frania from Career Services for being here. And to our four alums, mm -hmm. Fatima, Grecia, Monica, and Sophia, their information has been invaluable. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to the students and talk to all of us about your experience within this program. And 
Up on the screen, you see a survey evaluation. We always try to improve ourselves when we do these student alumni roundtables. So if you could use that QR code so that you could take the survey just to let us know how we did with the roundtable, things that you liked, things that we can improve on, so we can put that information forward to the next roundtable. And the second QR code where it says get involved, we're always looking for our alums or students to get involved with our GSEP community. And clicking on that QR code, you'll be able to see a list of all the activities that we participate in within GSEP and we want you to become involved with. So once again, thank you for joining us for this Student Alumni Roundtable, and we look forward to seeing you again for our next roundtable. Everyone have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you.